this morning when I, I realized that it was the 50th anniversary of the Kent State shooting. So for those of you who were in your previous life at that time, um, this was May 4th, 1970. Uh, the country was in the middle of the Vietnam War. There were uh, protests for years going on at colleges and universities. And uh, Kent State, it, it was in southern, mid-Ohio, mid southern Ohio, somewhere in Ohio. Uh, and the students there had, you know, been demonstrating and so on. And a few of uh, the, the shooting was on Monday. Thursday there had been demonstrations. Friday also. Saturday there were a few People, most of the students were, you know, nonviolent. But Saturday evening, they burned the um, some of the more violent ones burned the ROTC uh, building. Uh, ROTC is Reserve Officer Training Corps. It's how the military tried to recruit college uh, kids to go, you know, into the military as officers after they graduated. So these students, uh, you know, they favored the military, they favored the war. It was hard for them on campus um, because not everybody really agreed with them. And, uh, and across the country, there was a lot of hostility towards ROTC. Anyway, they, they burnt the building down on Saturday. Um, Sometime in there, maybe on Friday, the governor who was facing re-election, um, uh, not the governor, the mayor asked the governor for help, and the governor was facing re-election. He sent the National Guard. So the National Guard is, um, how do you describe the National Guard? It's like a, a reserve of the army you know, so that if things happen in the country and they need support somewhere, they can call up the National Guard. So at that time, the National Guard very often um, consisted of other young people who didn't want to go to Vietnam um, because it was so dangerous there. And, and so they joined the National Guard because that way they could stay in the States and not get drafted because there was a draft going on. And if you got drafted, it was kind of like natural. You were going to Vietnam. And uh, so they, they called up the, Na the National Guard. And then on Monday, there was another protest scheduled. Uh, so all these kids came, you know, to the big common ground where all the universities had them, uh, not like Singapore where there's no big place in the entire city where people can gather for a demonstration. They built it like that deliberately. Um, huh? Oh, okay. But you can't, pro you can't protest anywhere in Singapore. Um, but uh, in America, we have lots of places to <laughs> protest, <laughs> as you know. So uh, the students gathered there, and um, a few of them started throw throwing rocks at the National Guard because, you know, the students were gathered for a rally. The National Guard came. As soon as you have the National Guard, and a bunch of anti-war students. It's, it's not a setting for a happy birthday party or a, a feel-good party. It's the setting for conflict. And so sure enough, you know, some of the students started throwing rocks at the, uh, at the uh, National Guard, many of whom were young people, and uh, themselves you know, trying to get out of the war. And uh, 
the National Guard kind of got backed up into a corner along a fence, and then all of a sudden, they turned around and they started shooting live ammo at the students. None of the students, of course, thought they had live ammo in, in their guns. And this had not really been done before like that, that, that I remember anyway. Um, and they started shooting at the students, who of course were unarmed. And four kids were, um, were killed and a bunch of them were injured. And when this hit the newspapers, you know, the colleges and universities went crazy. Everybody went crazy. It was like, because this was the first time, really, that they had shot at the student protesters. Um, you know, before, at, in the, uh, in the um, democratic, uh, what? what? The democratic yeah, the National Convention in 68. There were a lot of protesters. They were beating them there with clubs. They weren't shooting them with live ammo. This, this was something really different. And, you know, the students across the whole country, you know, it was like everybody was in shock. They're killing us, you know. Why are they killing us? So until today, I had always seen this from the viewpoint of the students, because I was a student at that time, okay? I was in my junior year at UCLA, and we were having protests. And then it was like, whoa, you know, what's happening? And today, when I started reading more about it, I, it gave me a much broader picture of what was going on. Of course, I still always thought, you know, my sympathy is with the students. Um, but it was interesting to hear from all the different parties involved their perspective on it. So from the town where the university was in, yeah, there was a regular town and the townspeople had their shops and everything and many of them had worked very hard to set up their shops and their stores and earn a living. And they saw the kids at the university as, um, you know, just people passing through. They weren't living there. They were just going to be there for a few years. They were going somewhere else. Uh, yeah, they, they welcomed the income from the university in the town, but they really didn't like the, when the students went to bars. They didn't like when the students were smoking grass. Uh, they didn't like the protests and the, you know, this kind of thing. So the, the townspeople were really kind of put off with the whole thing. Then you have the governor uh, who is running for re-election. So he has to, you know, do something. Then uh, you have the National Guard uh, who you know, like I said, are very often uh, kids themselves who didn't want to go to fight the war and so join the National Guard instead. And they weren't, you know, much older than the kids at the university. And to this day, 50 years later, no one knows why the National Guard, which was backing off, suddenly turned around and started shooting. No one knows why that happened, or who gave the command, or what was going on. Yeah. But it really made me think, you know, you have anger on the part of the students, anger on the part of the townspeople, anger and, uh, on the part of the National Guard. Okay, you have fear from all all those parties too, because they all want to protect their their interests. Some are material interests. Some are you know uh, 
political values or whatever, or moral interest. Uh, and, you know, when you have anger like that, I mean, it's a recipe for disaster, isn't it? So it was making me think of what's happening in the country now with the protests. And, you know, uh, there I was on the side of the students. And now I look at the people who are protesting. Uh, again, supposedly they're protesting uh, a government that they see as overpowering, which was what we were protesting back then, too. But they're coming out in public carrying their AK-47s, uh, going to, uh, you know, protest before the Capitol. And, uh, you know, it's very clear to me that, that a lot of these protesters, it's white supremacy. It's the people who are involved in white supremacy. And, you know, they're using this as a way to recruit people and all. But it's interesting to have been on the side of the protesters. Then, now I'm on the side of the governor. And then to see the president who is supposed to be the epitome of the government encouraging the protesters yeah and saying that again like just like he did in Charlottesville oh many of them are very good people and i understand you know their frustration just to see how you know part things change and yet they don't change yeah which side you're on changes but anger and fear rule everybody <laughs> to start with you know so it's interesting looking at that from a Buddhist viewpoint now, because now what I see is the disadvantages of anger, and I also see the play of karma and how uh, karma, you know, previous lives karma puts us in different situations in this life, and instead of seeing our situation as a play, a, a karmic play, we reify everything. And we have friends and enemies and strangers, and we have a, you know, a certain personality and creed and, and how tightly we hold on to things that are uh, basically just conditioned phenomena. Because I started thinking, you know, that at that time, back then, at the time of Kent State, you know, I was young, so and I was in university, and I had certain conditioning behind me. Yesterday, when I was doing the talk on gun violence, they asked a question about, you know, my personal history, how I got interested in gun violence. And I started talking about being born in the shadow of the Holocaust, and growing up with all of that and how deeply that informed me uh, and made me very nonviolent. So look at that conditioning there. Then the conditioning of the formative teenage years, uh, growing up in the middle of the race riots and the middle of the Vietnam War protests, and how the events in the broader society shaped who I am today, you know? Probably just as, you know, and of course my family shaped me, but the events in society were really, you know, between the Holocaust and the war and the race, right? This really shaped me very, very much, you know? And to see how we often don't see each other, we don't see ourselves as um, conditioned phenomena. You know, we think there's a real me and I believe in these things kind of independently, 
You know, my beliefs are all independent. It's not that I was conditioned in a certain way to adopt perspectives, but these come from inside me. And, and really thinking, well, no, that's not exactly it. Yeah. I mean, part of what we believe in, part of what we heard, certainly comes from previous lives, <clears throat> you know, without a doubt because we have certain tendencies and, and so on. So we have our previous life conditioning us, we have our family, we have what's going on in the country we're born in, you know, at that time. And so looking at all these different conditioning factors, and yet we still see ourselves as an independent person, yeah? And, and how uh, we aren't independent people, <laughs> yeah? I mean, th uh, some of our very deepest beliefs are things that are conditioned, yeah? And that we have subsequently chosen to believe because we think they're right, you know? And because now with Buddhist conditioning, we've examined a lot of our previous conditioning and decided what of our previous conditioning we like and we want to continue have to have, and what of our previous conditioning. Now that we are Buddhist, we want to decondition ourselves about, because, you know, our attitude has changed, our values have changed. But, uh, yeah, so it's just making me think a lot about how conditioned we are. And, <clears throat> and then, uh, you know, recognizing that conditioning and also recognizing uh, our opportunity to reform that conditioning. Yeah. And opening our mind to see how other people are conditioned. You know, because when I see, you know, the, the, the photographs now of the protesters, these big white guys with beards carrying military uh, weapons in the street. Yeah. So, uh, you know, with angry faces, you know, this is what we see, the pictures that we see now. And think, you know, these people are also conditioned by their previous lives, by their family, by what is going on in the country now. You know, and also, of course, by the media and what they hear and what they are told, uh, you know, about, uh, you know, the whole thing of the, the real Americans uh, are the white Christians. Mm -hmm. And this has been in, in American culture from the get-go. This is not something new, but it's being called up now. As a, as a movement um, because people are scared. But to, you know, but to see all these people in, in all these different situations and you know, we have the fortune of being able to sit and think about what do I really want to believe? And, and yet even in our past, we were just pushed by our, our conditioning things. And so how these people, everybody's being pushed by conditioning. And very few people really stop and think about it and decide what conditioning they want to accept and how they really want to reform themselves and decondition certain things. So that's what I had to share with you today. And we will get around to talking about the fifth, sixth, and seventh of the seven limb prayers. But, you know, when these things come up and they're anniversaries, it's a good chance to kind of revisit what you experienced in your life and how you saw it then, how you see it now. But it's still so much of a tragedy. I mean, what happened was a, a horrible tragedy for those kids. 
Uh, there's a movie. They made a movie about Kent State, which is is worth watching at some point. To make prayers that violence stops any kind of violence towards anybody for any reason. And to stop violence, you have to stop anger and resentment. And to stop anger and resentment, you have to stop attachment. And to stop attachment, you have to stop ignorance. And to stop ignorance, we need to meditate on emptiness. And to meditate on emptiness, we have to study it and try and understand it. That's the hard part, <laughs> OK? But you know, we're fortunate to have met the Buddha's teachings and be able to do this. <laughs>